Hi everyone, Adam Steele from Hot Pole Studios here, and today we're going to talk about IRs, impulse responses in relation to guitar cabinets. You might have heard of virtual cabinets. If you tried downloading some from the internet, that's one thing, but what if you've got the real deal and you want to capture that so you can use it at home or out on the road or in something like a, a modeler? Well, today we're going to go through it step by step. So if you're unsure of what an IR is, we've done a separate video on that, which you can click the link in the corner there, or look in the description below. We talk at some length there about the ins and outs, so here we're just going to dive right in. Prior warning, this video gets pretty technical, but I feel that's necessary so you understand the process and get the best results. Firstly, let's make a list of what you're going to need. We need the cabinet we want to capture, I'm going to use this 4x12 Zilla, the microphone we want to capture it with, I'm going to use the classic SM57, the amp we want to get our initial tone with, in our case usually a tube amp of some description, this part is very much a personal choice. We need another amp, but a linear solid state one, PA power amps are particularly good for this application, a laptop or desktop computer, PC or Mac is fine, a good quality interface. We're going to use the Audient ID44. Software. We're going to use Reaper for our recordings and Voxengo's Deconvolver for the IR stuff. There are other options like Logic in its Space Designer or Two Notes Blend IR software, so whatever works for you, that's cool. The principles don't change. So now we have all of this stuff, let's start at the start. Think about it this way What are you trying to capture? An impulse response is a capture of a specific sound of a specific thing. So what are you going to use it for? I know that all sounds a bit philosophical, but it helps you get a result that you're happy with. For instance, in our case here, we're going to get the sound of a big cabinet in a heavy rock metal setup so that it sounds bright, punchy and clear. That already sets the stage for how we're going about this. This is what we need the tube amp for, because step one is to get a great sound out of that cabinet through that microphone. Forget IRs for just a minute, set up the amp to a point where you're happy with the tone, then put the mic on the cabinet in a place where you think you'll get the right results, and just record a little sample of it. Play it back for yourself, either on headphones or on studio monitors, however you feel works best for you. Is it too bright? Move that mic around until it's good. Is it too roomy? Move the mic closer. And so on and so forth. Repeat recording little segments and listening back until you're happy with how this setup sounds, because that's the result you're going to end up with at the end of this whole exercise. This reminds me of the old builders saying, measure twice, cut once. Okay, so once we're happy with the sound we're getting, we can go ahead and remove the tube amp from the equation. Leave the cab and the mic exactly where they are, but this is where the PA system power amp comes in. You can place it on top of the cab. Personally, I'm keeping mine in the next room on a long speaker cable, just because its fan is noisy and I don't want that noise on the IR capture. Why are we doing this? Tube amps have a particular way that they interact with the speaker cabinet, non-linearities if you will. And when you're playing guitar, that's great, it's a big part of the sound. The problem here is that we're trying to capture the cabinet and not the amp. So we need to use something that can make a lot of noise, but doesn't impart a character of its own. That's where the solid state amp comes in. So the next step is that we have to have our computer and interface set up so that they can send a signal out through that power amp and record the microphone in front of the cabinet. In our case here, it's this laptop with Reaper and the Audient ID44 interface. I've got a cable going from output 3 of the ID44 to that power amp, that way I can still use outputs 1 and 2 for my headphone mix or speaker mix. Since in the previous step you would have been recording samples of what you were playing into your DAW, we can assume that this part is already good to go, 
and that you had your game set on the microphone preamp so that it wasn't clipping when you played it back or anywhere near clipping for that matter. Personally, I tried to leave roughly 12 dB of headroom above the loudest part of a single track because that's where a lot of interfaces operate well and it gives you a buffer if at any point there's a sudden loud noise. In our case, even though we're using a simple sine wave, this can still happen if the cabinet resonates at a particular frequency and gives us a big spike. The thing we need to send through our cabinet is a sine wave sweep. To do this, I'm going to generate one using Voxengo's Deconvolver. Once you open it up, there's a button at the bottom labelled Test Tone Gen. In this menu, we can make ourselves a sweep or test tone. I personally keep the bit depth at 24. I go with 96 kilohertz, mostly because I want this capture to be really high quality. Although you can do it with lower sample rates if you wish. Make it mono. And for me, I go with 60 seconds, although 30 seconds is usually fine as well. In theory, a longer sweep gives us more detail in the long run, although I'm sure there are diminishing returns after a certain point. Save that file somewhere you remember. We need this file even after the capture is complete to finish the process, so make sure you don't lose it. Before we get to what we're going to do with this file, I wanted to talk quickly about Patreon. We take a lot of time out of our day jobs at the studio to make these videos, and the only way we can make it all happen and keep the lights on is with your amazing support through Patreon. If you like what you're seeing here, consider helping us out with a dollar a month or so. In return, you get early access to the videos as well as direct connection to me and the team with first shout at questions for viewers' comments and live podcast videos. Thanks to everyone who's supported us so far. Big thank you. You guys are the best. Now, on with the show. Once we have our sine wave, we drop it onto a channel in Reaper or your favourite DAW of choice. For what we're doing here, they're all the same, but the instructions here will be Reaper specific. Side note here, whichever sample rate you generated your sweep at, I highly recommend you set your DAW and interface to use that same sample rate, or problems can occur down the line. So, this channel we've made here, we need to route out of this third input out of the ID44 interface, and not out of the master output. Not unless we want a huge headache. It is possible to do this with an interface with only two outputs, but do be careful not to have any headphones or studio monitors attached as they will make terrible sounds. Before we play that back, let's be careful to take the output volume on that channel way down and start there. That way, it's not going to start out too loud and blow up a speaker, especially important if you're capturing vintage and hard to replace speakers. Start with your power amps volume on zero and slowly bring it up until you hear some sound then bring your DAW track volume up to maybe minus 12 or minus 6. Then if it's still quite quiet, then bring up the volume on the power amp until it's about the same volume that you were playing the amp at before you switched from valves to the solid state amp. It should be fairly loud, as in my experience you want the guitar speakers to be moving quite a bit, and being pushed into working in a non-linear way. That's one of the things that makes guitar speakers so interesting to us. Next, we make sure that we have a second track armed to record our microphone that's already in position. And we make sure it's not set to track monitor or to come out of the same channels of the interface as the original sweep. Otherwise, we're going to end up with some horrible feedback, and that is bad. Not only for your ears, but potentially for your equipment. I know that I've blown tweeters before with uncontrolled feedback. At this point, we set our transport in the DAW before the start of the sine wave sweep. We put on ear defenders and we press record. And at this point, we have a sweep capture. If you want to have multiple captures, say with different microphones, different positions and so on, now's the best time to do so. Mute the capture that you've made, make sure it's not recording anymore, and make a new track. Set it up again and start sweeping one more time. Something that's worth noting here is if you want to have multiple captures at once, you can do this just by adding more tracks with more microphones and more inputs on your interface. The ID44 has four inputs, so I'm going to add a Sennheiser 421 and two ribbons further back in the room on a stereo channel which I'll use later on. 
The intention isn't necessarily to use all of these mics in one go, but that's something we'll talk about later on. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are now at my house in Studio B because we don't need to be in the studio for the rest of this process. So, uh, first thing we're gonna do is look at our project here where we have our sweeps that we made. I've purposefully turned the volume down so you don't all go deaf, but they sound like this. And you can see that big, massive rainbow of a thing there. I That's our original sweep. I have Reaper set in a particular way so you can actually see the frequency of audio, which I find quite useful. But you can see that sweep that goes up by octaves and yeah. So that's incredibly loud. We don't want to hear that. Uh, so this particular channel here is that SM57 that we captured. Uh, this channel here is that uh, Sennheiser 421. And that channel is those uh, stereo ribbons that we captured a little further back. So for now, let's just concentrate on the SM57 and keep this simple. And then we'll go a little bit cleverer in a minute. So the first thing we're going to want to do is get this uh, rendered, bounced out as a file. We need it, ideally, to be exactly as long as our original sweep and to start at exactly the same time. So this is dependent on whatever your digital audio workstation is, but the way, the easiest way to do this in Reaper with absolute certainty is if I click on my original sweep one time to highlight that, then right click on the bar at the top where the time is, there should be a button that says, the button's right there, I'm being stupid, it's set selection to items. So if I click that, I've made it into a keyboard shortcut, but generally that button is there and you see that that whole area of the project is lit up. So now that means that if we were to hit play, that would start, you can actually see where the audio starts to be captured and it ends at the appropriate time. So if we now go to file, render, again, this may be slightly different on if you're using something that's not Reaper, but what we would want to do is make sure this is going to the right folder. Uh, let's call this SM57 sweep file, just so we know it's called something a bit particular. If we export our time selection, which is exactly what we've done, which the length is exactly one minute, you'll see there. Hold the phone, hold the phone. I came up with a rather strange bug here where we actually want the export to be slightly longer than the 60 seconds to make sure that there isn't this weird bug in Deconvolver. So yeah, I took the selection, definitely made sure it started at the same point that it was supposed to, but just went on just a little longer. So now if I go to render this, which is under file and render, I just pressed the file shortcut there. I'm gonna call this SM57 sweep file and then that's just over a minute it's bound to the time selection to make sure it's specifically capturing this and not the entire project uh, 96 kilohertz which is what we've been working at all the time it's in mono so I've chosen mono uh, we want it to be a WAV file at 24 bit so when I hit render one file, if there's an already existing file, I hit overwrite and it goes like this, zip. So we now have a file. So I'll now open this up and drag it onto the screen so you can see what's going on. Okay, so now we have at the bottom here our SM57 sweep file, which is still technically no use to us. Now we have to deconvolve it. So we open deconvolver. And the first thing we do is we browse to where our test tone is. This is why I said we need it later on. And we tell it that's where that is. Okay, great, thank you very much. Now we go to file folder just below it. And in the fully paid professional version of Deconvolver, you can drop any number of files in, but here you can only really do one. So I'm gonna add in SM57 sweep file. And at the bottom, I want it to be 24 bit. I want to include minimum phase transform, which is a thing which makes sure that the impulse starts right on the bang, which means that when you play a chord, you get no delay there. You get exactly what you're supposed to. And I'm gonna hit normalize to minus 0.3 dBFS as well, just to make sure that that impulse is as loud as it reasonably can be, so that when we play it back, we get what we're supposed to. 
and hit process. Shouldn't take long. And how about that? It didn't take long. So now we've got SM57 sweep file underscore DC, which I'm going to call SM57 IR HPS Hot Pole Studios. Uh, you, you can name this whatever you like. Uh, so if I now just drop this in Reaper back here, we should be able to see if we zoom right in. Yeah, there's a spike there and then stuff afterwards. And that is an impulse response. It's not particularly interesting looking. And it just sounds like a knock on the door. And they all kind of sound similar if you just play it back. Now this is where we'll, we'll actually uh, do a bit of a demonstration. So, I'm going to pull in now a file, uh, just a guitar DI. That'll do. Okay, so I've got a DI guitar, which doesn't sound particularly impressive. But when I put... When I put a guitar amp on this, uh, let's see, one of the Thermionics, JCM800 amp, say, with the, amp, the gain fairly high, I'm going to turn the output down because it's going to sound terrible. Because that's how a guitar amp sounds without its cabinet and without the microphone and all that kind of stuff. And that's where we need to load in an impulse response after the amp. If you've got a real guitar amp and you've used something like a, a two notes captor, which is one of those load boxes with a line out and tried to record that, this is what it will sound like. And it will sound terrible because it's not got the speaker and everything that comes after that fact. So this, this is what you have to do next is beyond this amp, you load in your impulse response loader. And we're going to use ReCabinet, if I can spell. So this is ReCabinet from Kazrog. And what I'm gonna do specifically is I'm going to find my, uh, I'm finding my impulse response. And that is SM57 IR. Make sure the other side is turned off. And hopefully, well, let's just try it without and then with. I mean, I yes, I could then go on to change all the settings on the amp, use a different amp, whatever it is that I would want to do, and then do EQ and other things after the amp like you would with a real guitar amp. But that is ahead going into our cabinet that we've captured. Right. Turn the mids down, turn a bit of treble up there, a bit of bass. And there we have it. We have an impulse response that we made and that sounds halfway decent. We, you can then do things like you can play around with impulse responses. You can do clever stuff that's way beyond the scope of this video. But if you don't want to do that, it's right there. Like another thing that you can do, because this impulse response is completely virtual, of course, you can now drop in as many instances of this as you like. So I've actually brought in on another channel uh, the second take of this guitar amp. So if I take the first one and pan it all the way left, the second one and pan it all the way right, and then in my mix window, I'm just going to copy across that amp and the copy of ReCabinet with our impulse in. This should be in full stereo now. Sounds pretty decent to me as a starting point, and that's just the SM57. Now, let's do one more thing in this video where we'll get a little bit clever. Let's go back to where we were. I'll just hide the mix window to make things easier to look at. 
because uh, what you'll see here is I did make an SM57 capture, uh, a Sennheiser 421, and room ribbon mics. Now if we listen a little bit, I'll turn it down again to the SM57 capture. Sounds kind of mid-ish where the 421 has more going on and actually you can you can see in this green area here it's got more in the high range and also the ribbons you can actually hear it in the higher range it's in stereo it's it's different so different things are happening in different places in that stereo image so what we're going to do is we're going to solo all three of these together and then we're going to set selection to items again, like we did before on that sweep, make it a little bit longer because of that really weird bug. And that should, if we leave them all playing, when we render this out, we'll make one file that incorporates all of those microphones in a blend. Uh, if I open my mix window here, I can change with my faders how much of each microphone I want. For argument's sake for this, let's just say I want them all to be equal, but if I wanted this blend but a bit less of the ribbon, a bit more of the 421, say you can see me taking the ribbon down and bringing up the 421. The 421. So, there are a million different ways you could do this and you can get creative. Do whatever you like with this. It, it can be really quite personalized. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna have all three of these and what we're going to do now is export this as our, let's call it HPS combo sweep file. And we're going to change the output from mono to stereo. Now hopefully this will work and it will just use the same impulse response sweep that we had on both sides to create as a stereo IR file. That would be lovely. So let's just see what happens now. So it's still, it's stereo, 24 bit, render one file. Yes please. And that's not clipped or anything, which is great. So if I go back to Deconvolver, it may complain at me, HB, S, HPS combo sweep. It may complain that it's a demo mode, but let's try this process. It seems to be doing it. With our minimum phase and normalized to minus 0.3 and all that good stuff. Yep, and that popped us out a file. Uh, the combo file, DC. Yep, so let's call that the Hot Pole Studios combo IR. Why not? It's a silly name. But now, let's go back to one of these virtual guitars. Uh, I'll put it back in the middle, so you'll hear that what we're using now is just the SM57, which is of course being a single microphone is just mono. Drop it in. Yeah, it's definitely a stereo file, so it's probably that the Kazrog loader doesn't like stereo files. Okay, so let's get clever and let's use a different IR loader. What have I got? Um, ah, yes, I can use Reaper's own inbuilt IR loader. So the first thing I do, this is reverb, is I click the ZL button for zero latency and I turn off the dry signal. Uh, from here, if I add a file, it's going to come up with a pop-up and we're going to find our impulse response file that we've made and it's going to be the combo IR right there. You can see it's stereo. It's over three seconds long, which is quite interesting. Oh! There's a weird kind of ringing going on at the end of the file. That's interesting. I have to have a, a look at that because it's that's something that I did not expect. Yeah, there's a weird kind of ringing. Uh, Trim, gain, stretch. Oh, I can put a trim in and I can make the maximum length less to get rid of that weird ringing at the end. So by taking the rest of that reverb off, which I'm guessing would have been from the room reverb from the ribbons, if it picked up a little bit of background noise at some point and then thought that was supposed to be part of the capture, that can happen. But now...
That sounds pretty good to me. It sounds fairly realistic. It's kind of got some life to it. Uh, let's copy that over to the other guitar and see what happens if I solo them together. That sounds huge. I mean, there's a certain kind of in there, but I think that's from the virtual amp. Uh, so that pretty much concludes that. So that's our highest level, most advanced impulse response capture of our own cabinets being used with a virtual amp right here in my home office without having to make any noise. So ladies and gentlemen, that's how you capture an impulse response. Uh, I hope this step-by-step -step tutorial has been really useful for you. It's been fun doing this. So. Uh, thank you very much for uh, watching. If you really enjoyed this, uh, hit the like button uh, and please subscribe to the channel for more of this kind of stuff. Uh, we, if we find that this is a successful video, I'll definitely do more, more of this kind of stuff. Uh, also, if, if you'd really like to support us to do more of this kind of stuff, uh, consider helping us out on Patreon. If you give us a dollar a month, it's kind of like buying us a beer, but that really helps us to keep the lights on and keep going and keep doing more of this kind of stuff because every time we make videos like this, we have to take time out of being studio engineers. So it really is appreciated. Uh, thank you, everybody. I'm Adam Steele for Hop Pole Studios, and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye. Thanks for watching guys. If you enjoyed this, feel free to check out our other videos as you can find here, or check out our Facebook and Twitter, or our Patreon page which helps us to make more videos like this. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video.